Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A couple of weeks ago, I did a video about the history of the Thor rocket, and now it's time to do the sequel, The Sons of Thor, talking about Delta, right? And this is actually going to be a two-parter because it turns out the history of Delta and Thor is really long. So yeah, let's rewind again to the start of NASA. They had big plans and they needed big rockets. But initially they had to settle on something they could get a hold of and they created a version of the Thor Abel which they modified for reliability and renamed Thor Delta. NASA originally ordered 12 of these in April of 1959 and they used them to launch their first satellites. The first launch was the Echo 1 balloon satellite in May of 1960, but the launch failed and so the first successful launch of the Thor Delta carried its replacement Echo 1A in August and that would prove the concept of communication relay satellites. And then the next 10 launches after that would also succeed, which was a level of reliability that was unheard of at the time. NASA decided to continue with this formula and they started adding improvements incrementally. And indeed, over the following decades, the teams behind Delta managed to keep this interim launch vehicle competitive with everything else by scaling it up to new requirements with incremental changes one at a time. At the start of the Delta's launch career, it was able to perhaps put 100 kilograms into low Earth orbit. And by the 1990s, it was lofting two-ton satellites into geostationary orbits. Now, initially, the Delta variants would be given alphabetical designations as updates were made to the design. So in 1962, the Delta A was introduced. It had an improved MB3 Block 2 engine that delivered a little more thrust and more reliability. Delta A also redesigned the top of the main booster, the Interstage, which uh, resulted in a mass saving and a shorter rocket. And that, of course, translated directly into more mass uh, capability. So the Delta A would only launch twice before the Delta B was introduced, and that flew nine times from 1962 to 1964. So the Delta B stretched the second stage by about a meter and added an improved AJ-10 engine. This increased the performance of the rocket enough that Delta was able to send the first spacecraft into geosynchronous orbit, but not without some road bumps along the way. SYNCOM-1 was the first attempt, and it would get up to the target altitude but as its kick motor fired, the spacecraft stopped transmitting. Telescopes would later show the dead spacecraft in a 24-hour orbit, meaning it had made it, but died when it got there. SYNCOM 2 would actually be the first to relay transmissions, but when it got there, it was int intentionally placed into an inclined orbit. So while it was geosynchronous, it wasn't geostationary. It was making a figure eight motion across the equator rather than hovering over a single spot. Delta C first appeared in 1963 and it flew 11 times until 1967. Delta C upgraded the third stage with a new ABL X258 motor, which delivered about 20% more performance, mostly through better specific impulse. And then there was another small upgrade to the third stage for the Delta C-1 in 1966, and that would fly twice and be the last Delta to fly without any solid boosters until the 21st century. So Delta D was the thrust augmented Delta. It added three Castor strap-on solid rocket motors to the first stage and a new Block 3 engine, which had a small improvement in performance, but really was about improving the reliability. So this arrived in 1964, and its first flight was used to place the SYNCOM-3 satellite in a proper geostationary orbit. So the satellite would be positioned over the Pacific and enabled live TV broadcast of the, so of the Tokyo Olympics to viewers in the United States. It would also carry the early bird, also known as the uh, Intelsat-1, which was the first commercial satellite, and that provided satellite relay for either TV sign a TV signal or dozens of telephone calls depending upon the needs. But now, with the extra solid rocket booster assisted takeoff, a new 
fatter, heavier and better performing second stage was possible. So in 1965, Delta E took the tank design from the Thor Able Star second stage. And now Delta was able to put 735 kilograms into low Earth orbit. It would be known as Thrust Augmented Improved Delta. But there was also an E1 variant with a less powerful third stage and the Delta G, which dropped the third stage altogether. There was also the Delta J, which had a Star 37 third stage, which only flew once. Also, depending upon the mission, they could choose between the Castor 1 or Castor 2 solid rocket motors, with the Castor 2 generating less thrust overall, but they would run for longer uh, your duration. So yeah, Delta E would use the new lift capabilities to launch Pioneer 6, 7, 8, 9 into heliocentric orbit to observe the solar wind. These spacecraft would continue to operate well into the 1980s, with Pioneer 7 observing the interaction of Halley's comet tail with the solar wind in 1986. And Pioneer 6 was still broadcasting telemetry when they checked in the year 2000 on its 35th anniversary. So three Delta E's would also launch weather satellites from Vandenberg in 1966 and 67. These would be the first Deltas to launch from the West Coast, which was still calling them Thor Delta back then. So by 1965, there was a huge variety of Delta options available to match the mission requirements. The thrust augmented improved Delta was one of the most reliable rockets that NASA had, but it was nearing the limits of its capabilities of that first stage, which had been designed to be small for logistical reasons, namely loading them onto planes to take to Britain. In 1966, NASA borrowed another update that had been tested and perfected by the Air Force, the Long Tank Thor, stretching the first stage and removing that taper. In the Air Force, this was paired with the Agena, but NASA kept the simpler Delta upper stages and created three more new variants, differentiated by the third stage. So Delta N would be the Long Tank Booster and the Delta second stage, but with no third stage. Delta L used that, but added a 300 kilogram FW4D solid rocket motor as a third stage. And Delta M, the most popular variant, it flew a dozen times and its third stage was a Star 37 solid rocket motor, which provided twice the impulse of the other stage. And that allowed Delta to now deliver over a ton to low earth orbit or 350 kilograms to geostationary orbit. The second Delta M launch in 1968, carrying Intel Sat 3, was notable because it was a launch failure and it brought to an end a run of 25 consecutive successful launches for the Delta. Again, unheard of reliability in that era. In the 1970s, the payload was again boosted by the arrival of the N6 and M6 variants, which doubled the number of solid boosters to six. These would use a staggered ignition program, uh, process where three of the boosters were lit on the ground and when those burned out, three more would be lit in the air before all six were ejected in one uh, event. The N6 was used to launch the improved Tyros or ITOS weather satellites in the early 1970s, which were operated by the newly created National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration or NOAA. Then in 1972, that was the year that Delta really came into its own for several reasons. First of all, McDonnell Douglas, they introduced a new naming scheme which would use a four digit number to specify what stages were involved. No longer were we talking about A, B, C or D and some magical invocation. It was a number which told us what they were. The first digit would be the type of the first stage and the boosters attached. The second would be the number of strap-on boosters used. The third digit would tell us what the second stage was, and then the fourth digit would tell us what the third stage was. So one of the first variants that flew under this scheme was just the Delta 900, and that was in 1972, with an implicit first digit of zero. This used nine first stage boosters with six lighting at launch and three in flight, and no third stage. And this was used to orbit Landsat 1 from Vandenberg. 
So this flight of the Delta 900 was the moment that Delta really came into its own rather than simply being an offshoot of the Thor program. McDonnell Douglas were developing improvements for Delta that weren't simply hand-me-downs from the Air Force Thor. The Delta 900 flew with a new guidance system, new updated second stage with an engine that was derived from the Titan trans stage, uh, and that would actually be the baseline going forwards. There were also flights by the Delta 300, which of course you now know had only three strap-on boosters. 1972 also saw the introduction of the extended long tank Delta, which added another three meters to the length of the booster and introduced an entirely new method of manufacturing the tanks using a triangular isogrid grid pattern that was machined into the panels, which meant the tank stretch didn't actually add that much mass overall while adding a lot more fuel capacity. A new second stage option was also introduced and the second stage in the new deltas would be hung inside the interstage which was the same diameter of the rest of the rocket and this meant the whole rocket was now a constant diameter all the way up through to the fairing. This would be known as the straight 8 delta in con contrast to the previous generations. So under the new numerical designation system this transformation of the first stage booster meant that it marked the introduction of the 1000 series deltas. The first launch of this was in September of 1972 with Explorer 47 on a Delta 1604, the four representing the Star 37E third stage that was needed to push the spacecraft into its high Earth orbit. The first straight eight Delta was the Canadian ANIC A1 communications satellite on a Delta 1914 launched into geostationary orbit in November of 1972. So the next evolution for the 2000 series in 1974, this replaced those aging MB3 engines with the RS-27. These RS-27 engines were originally H1 engines for the Saturn 1B. There was eight of them on each Saturn and dozens of them were left over as the Apollo program was wound down. The straight eight second stage would now be powered by the TRW TR201 engine and that also traced its history to the Apollo program. It was derived from the lunar module descent engine. So while these were more hand-me-downs from other programs, but Delta benefited greatly from them with the new engines enabling 1.8 tons to low earth orbit and 700 tons to geostationary orbit. In 1974, the first Delta 2000 launched Skynet 2A, a British military satellite. Unfortunately, there was a failure in the second stage, which resulted in the spacecraft ending up in an unstable orbit, while the investigation would place the blame on an improperly coated circuit board, I'm pretty sure they skipped over all those claims about time traveler from the future trying to change history. The Delta 2000 series would launch satellites for other US allies, Canada, France, other NATO members and so on and so forth. But Japan, they had a different idea. Japan licensed the Delta design and created their N1 rocket, not to be confused with the Soviet N1. So the N1 or Nippon 1 was essentially a copy of the Delta M, but with all the parts fabricated by Japanese manufacturers with a few small exceptions for security reasons. The first stage, for example, was built by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. The engine was built by Ishikawa Jimmy Harima Heavy Industries. Nissan made the solid motors and the N1 would debut in 1975 and launch successfully six times, including Japan's first geostationary satellite, Kiku-2. There was one more launch of the N1 which failed when the third stage collided with the satellite after separation. The N2 appeared in 1981 and it upgraded the design to match the straight eight delta, and this would fly eight times until 1987. Finally, Japanese engineers created the H1, and this was more than just a copy of the existing Delta. It replaced the upper stage with a new hydrogen fueled stage powered by a homegrown LE5 engine, which could be restarted in space. 
So the H1 could deliver 1.1 tons to geostationary transfer orbit, better than the delta it was derived from. And the US delta wouldn't actually get a hydrogen upper stage until the delta 3 in 1998, and it wasn't exactly a success story. Okay, so with that bit of parallel evolution dealt with, let's return to the original thread. So, the 3000 series of Delta introduced the Castor 4 solid rocket motors, and those had twice the mass of the original Castor 1s. They again offered the Delta a handy step up in their performance. The first payload used, they used these would be RCA's SATCOM 1 satellite. Indeed, RCA had apparently contributed money to the development costs for those larger boosters because they needed that for their large 870 kilogram communication satellites. The 3000 series would get a few other upgrades along the way, improved guidance uh, avionics, a second stage engine upgrade, and a larger Star 48 third stage option. But most people thought the Delta was living on borrowed time because the space shuttle was entering service in 1981, and NASA made it very clear that they would be moving all their satellite launches off of Delta and other expendable vehicles and onto the space shuttle. And so we end this episode with Delta facing its biggest threat yet. What will happen next? Who knows? We'll find out next time. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.